happy Thanksgiving week. And I'm so thankful that you decide each and every week to join us here in our adult Bible study series online. And um, I, I know several of you catch me sometimes on a Sunday, or maybe you're in town visiting because you watch out of town and you're always uh, quick to let me know. You know, you know, I, I watch on, on Wednesday nights and uh, not that I am anything and I certainly uh, don't deserve any uh, praise or anything of that nature, but I am so, so thankful and so grateful that you choose to spend your time listening to God's word as it's preached. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for you wanting to learn more about him. And uh, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is my church, Beacon Baptist Church. And I am so privileged to be able uh, to serve here as one of our pastors um, over, over missions and our adult Bible study and our discipleship. And uh, it, it is just such a privilege to serve God here at this church with these great people. If you don't have a church home and you live in the Raleigh area, we are right here on 2110 Traywick Road and on the east side of Raleigh. We have services on 1030 on Sunday morning, 6 p.m. on Sunday night, and then we also meet here together in small groups in our adult Bible study classes. There's something for every life stage on property. And um, on Sundays, our kid life meets in, in the morning, and we just have a wonderful time here on property. And um, if you need a church home, I, I would love to invite you to be part of our church family here at Beacon Baptist Church. We've been going through a series of building below the baseline, build below the baseline, and examining the parts of our life that only God sees, because no structure that is lasting is built on an improper foundation. And we have to make sure that our spiritual foundation is right. One of the first things that we talked about, the first thing that we talked about was our relationship with God and understanding our relationship with God, understanding that we must know Him personally. And then last week, we talked about our trust in God, how we have faith in Him. And then tonight, we're going to talk about something that is also common amongst Christ Christians, right? What, do, what, do, what, is, what, are one thing, what is the one thing that each and every one of us have in common? It's that we're sinners. It's that we're sinners. There's only been one person ever born into this world that was sinless, and his name was Jesus Christ, and he is the Savior of our sins. And we know, those of us that are saved and are on our way to heaven and have trusted Christ and his sacrifice for us, we know that in order for us to be saved, we first had to admit to ourselves that we are a sinner. And then we're so thankful that God forgave that sin and, was, and, and, and saves us and counts us as being uh, sons and daughters of God. And we're so thankful for that. But just because we're saved does not mean that we stop sinning. Sin is prevalent in each and every one of our lives. It is something that we battle each and every day. In fact, if you aren't battling sin today, it's because you've already given into sin today. And, um, and so the battle is, is, is nonstop. And so because of that, God doesn't want us to just go freely sin and, and those things. In fact, he says in the book of Romans, God forbid that, forbid. And, but one of the things that we have to understand, and this is something that is deeply personal is inside us and something that no one else sees. Once again, it's the foundation of a home that nobody sees. It's the foundation of our, our spiritual life that nobody sees. And that is the topic of repentance, of repentance. Now, if you've been with us on any sort of our live stream, if you join us on live stream for each and every service, you will know that pastor, our pastor, Pastor Raven, uh, just wrapped up a series that took about 18 months on the life of David. And, uh, and so tonight we are going to be examining David's life. And why are we going to be examining David's life? It's because David is one of the most prominent figures in Scripture. We know more about him than almost every person in Scripture. And he is given to us as a life to study out. So we're going to study this out and see from one of his circumstances how we can understand this matter of repentance. Once again, even though I wish it wasn't so, one thing that we all have in common is that we're sinners. It's that we're sinners. But we do know that we have an opportunity to repent, to repent. And it's something that, that it, as sin is prevalent in our life, um, I, I hope you come to the matter of repentance in your life. All Christians, if we're honest with ourselves and with each other, we would admit that from, from time to time, 
that sin issue that is below the surface of our of our hearts, okay, and um, such as the sin of of pride, of covetousness, of lust, of bitterness. One of the most deadly sins there are. Uh, the Bible tells us that by bitterness many are defiled, and and I know uh, 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 many of Christians uh, that will battle that, and uh, and and it, and it springs up. It, it but they're not often seen by others until it is already destructive. And then you destruct maybe even somebody else's life. One thing that we're going to learn tonight is that we do control, what we control is the decision to sin, but we don't control the consequence to sin. And in this portion of scripture, we will examine how it costs the lives of many, of many people. And so tonight we won't take the time to read all the scripture, and I would implore you to do that on your own time. But we're going to be looking at First Chronicles, First First Chronicles, excuse me, chapter twenty-one. First Chronicles, chapter twenty-one, and um, we'll be uh, going through and seeing several portions of it. And so, and and I want you truly to examine how do you respond to, to conviction in your life. And one of the great reminders of our salvation in, in my life, and hopefully in your life is that God convicts you when there is something wrong in your life. When that sin gets named, you know that that's something that is prevalent in your life and, and your heart is stirred. I hope, I hope that you're not like what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. It says, today if you will hear his voice, it says, harden not your heart. I hope that your hearts are not hardened to hearing conviction from the Holy Spirit. Rather, rather, instead of resisting the Holy Spirit, as many Christians will do when this time of sin and uh, conviction of sin starts, and they resist it because of pride, we respond as David responded here. In fact, we will look at this Psalm from Psalm 51 where he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. This was a Psalm written in, a, in concordance with this particular passage of scripture. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the closing days of David's life, and, and we're going to find that this man, after God's own heart, which we've heard a, a lot about over the last 18 months it, on, in Sunday morning service, but he had repentance in his life, and he had true repentance in his life. So let's look at a few things tonight. First thing what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the rebellion of David. We're going to look at why he needed to repent. You know, we when, when you mention a sin of David, most of the time when... When we're like, well, you know, David was a sinner. The first thing that comes to somebody's mind is, yes, you're right. David sinned with Bathsheba and um, had the had the child with her, and the, and, uh, and and then went even a step further and had her husband killed on the front line. And uh, and we think, you know what? David was an adulterer and a murderer in this regards. We think that is the sin that is most prevalent in David's life. But this, that being what we would name a great sin, did cause uh, consequences in David's family, for sure. It caused consequences um, in his uh, life even then. We know he repented of that, and God forgave him. But consequences still came. And you know, we'll, we'll talk about consequences here uh, towards the end. But if we really examine David's life, this sin that is named here, as we're going to study out tonight, really caused destruction of many more people. And it's something that maybe we look at and be like, well, it's not a great sin, but yet the fact is, is God called it a great sin. He called it a great sin. And something that we think, as we examine it, seems so small. And so um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of what we're talking about, and then we'll, we'll look at some Bible verses. Uh, the Bible tells us here, then also... It tells us in 2 Samuel that as David's life is nearing an end, uh, he goes to number the people. And we we're not told exactly why, but God didn't want him to number people. And it was very clear that God that David knew that. And, and so David decided to number the people, uh, even, at the, um, even as he's told uh, that uh, um, even by some of the people that were close to him, that it wasn't a good idea. It wasn't something that God wanted him to do. And so he did it. And then he is, he is confronted with that sin, 
and, and he repents, and then there's great consequence. Um, and we'll see those consequences uh, here in a bit of, of what he what he chose. God gave him three choices of what his punishment would be. He chose the one that was in God's hand, and but yet still many, many, many uh, thousands of people died that day because of the sin, this sin in David's life. So we see his rebellion, and we see where it started. You know, rebellion starts in our life a lot like it started in David's life. The first thing that we're going to see is it was a planted thought. It was a planted thought. This sin began, began for him as all sin does. It, it, it began with a planted thought in our mind. And the Bible makes it clear, it makes it clear that this thought to David was suggested by Satan himself. Now, I am so thankful that I am saved because that means the devil cannot have my heart. That is God's. And there's nothing I can do to, to, to lose that. The devil can't get inside my heart. But what he can do is he can get inside your mind. And he wants to do that. And it is where sin begins. It, it is many times the, the, the thought of the mind. The Bible begins in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1 by saying, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And so what is the Bible teaching us here? The Bible teaching us, that, you know, we say, well, what's wrong with numbering the people? Taking a census of military power, considering all the enemies that Israel had, it, 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 it seemed to only make sense that David would number the people. You see, that's the exact thought that Satan was probably using to provoke David. And, but the Bible says it's a plan of thought that this act of sin was instigated by Satan. And Satan is the great instigator. Satan is the great provoker. The Bible says that Satan did two things. He stood up against, meaning he was against God, and then he provoked. He provoked. The, if we define those words, it would mean that, once again, Satan rose up against John, and then he incited a Lord, instigated, and enticed David. And any sin that is in our life is many times the result, most of the time, if not every time, the result of a planted thought in our mind that comes out to fruition that more than likely was started by the devil himself. Some people are like, well, where'd you get that idea from? Well, David got this idea from Satan. The Bible makes this very, very clear. Because Satan and Satan's tactics have not changed. His plan to destroy us always begins with our thoughts. Which is why this which is why the Bible warns us. He war, it, the Bible warns us, it says, protect your thoughts. One of the most convicting verses in all of Scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And if you don't already know it, I hope you'll write this down, uh, this reference down, underline it in your Bible, highlight it in your Bible, in your Bible app, however you do that. In verse number five, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Cast down everything that pr promotes itself above God's knowledge, which is, by the way, a very prevalent thought in the world today. We talked about that in our previous series, It's Not What You Think. And bringing into every, th and, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The Bible makes it clear that we are to protect his mind, that we are to protect our mind. Satan uses this temptation of allurement through wicked imaginations and thoughts that should not be prevalent in our life. But he's enticing. He makes it enticing. You know, this week is Thanksgiving week. And um, I love Thanksgiving. I love, I love food. I, I like to cook food. Um, I smoked a couple turkeys the other day. Everybody's like, oh, turkey's dry. And, and I'll be that guy. And be like, well, you haven't had my turkey. And, uh, um, but I love, I love turkey. I love the ham. I love the green beans. I love the macaroni and cheese. I love the macaroni and cheese. I love the deviled eggs. I love it all. And one of the things I love as well, people are like, well, I could care less for uh, pumpkin pie. Well, I like pumpkin pie just fine. But one of my favorite things that my wife makes is a pumpkin pie cheesecake. Now, I don't know how you have a pumpkin pie cheesecake. It's either pie or cake. And I don't know why cheesecake is called cake because really it looks like a pie. And so, but it's this cheesecake pumpkin pie thing. And I am telling you, it is ridiculously good. 
And, and when she's in there prepping for it and um, it smells good, it looks good, you put whipped cream or vanilla ice cream or whatever you want to on top of it and it only gets better and, and you, you literally, I, I can't describe how good it is, how, how tasty it is. It is enticing. It's enticing. But can I, can I be honest with you? I, I'm not supposed to have sugar. I'm supposed to watch my sugar intake. You know what I didn't tell, tell you about any of that? How much sugar is in there? I have no clue how much sugar in there. All I know is there must be a lot because it tastes good and sugar tastes good. And that's what the devil does as an enticement in our mind. He makes it seem so appealing, but he, does, he doesn't ever explain the consequences to you. In fact, in fact, the devil will plant in your mind that, that the decision that you make to, to bring that thought into fruition and to your life will bring zero consequences. In fact, the consequences, he'll say, will be something that seems very appealing to you. But the fact is, is it's a lie. Because Satan is the father of lies. It's the way that temptation works. Satan suggests thoughts to our mind that appeal to our flesh. Satan knows what appeals to you. Now look, what appeals to you might not be what appeals to me. I, and, and I don't mean this. I know several people uh, struggle with this. Nevertheless, the Bible is very clear that it's a sin. But I, Satan would be hard-pressed to tempt me with something like alcohol. I have no desire for it. I've, I, I've never had it. That doesn't make me any better than anybody else. But, but there's nothing desire. I, he'd be hard to put that thought to, our, to my mind. But there are things that I do struggle with, just like anybody else struggles with things. Which we're all sinners. It's the thing we have in common. And the devil knows. The devil is a wily foe. He's going to he's going to try to attack us where we are weak. And he's going to make it seem very appealing to our flesh. But we are the one who has the choice whether to entertain those thoughts. That's the choice that we have. Every rebellious act that we commit can be traced back to our thought life. Our thought life. A place thought. And then we see where he goes to count the people. At this point, David goes directly against God. And he decides to number the people. Now, we're given this man that is very unique. Uh, preacher actually uh, mentioned him this past Sunday morning whose name is Joab. Uh, we see him throughout the life of David. He's related to David, and um, he's, a, he's a great warrior. And But yeah, he takes it upon himself to do some things. He wasn't always loyal to David. But in this particular circumstance that we see, he was loyal. The Bible says, And David said to Joab, And to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel, number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring the number of them to, to me, that I may know it. And so once again, I don't know Joab's exact thoughts for why he, he was. Once again, we know that there are some major issues in jo Joab's life. But it goes on to say, and Joab answered, The Lord makes his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then does my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab comes to him and once again, in his unique way, of telling David, there's no reason to do this. We all understand that, that this is something that God does not want us to do. And yet you would have me do this and cause a trespass against Israel? Joab recognized this danger. And in this circumstance, truly was a, a, a good friend or at least a, a sound advice in this circumstance. And um, based on his previous Acts, I, I think David had a mistrust of, of Joab, and rightfully so. But in this particular one, you know, he, he, he gave him truth. But you know, when times of rebellion are in our life, we're not going to hear the faithful wounds of a friend. In fact, we're going to take them, and we're going to think that we're being attacked. You know, when we have that hidden sin underneath the baseline, 
our normal response is that we respond like we are being attacked by somebody because they come and they point out that sin. And I, and I don't care who you are, what position you may hold within a church. If you can't be confronted with sin, you have a pride problem that probably has stemmed from, from a sin below the baseline in your life. But he would none of his counsel. He would none of uh, the, the, these words of wisdom. It was an act of rebellion. That was started by the root of pride. Who's, who is he to tell me anything? Anything. And so, unfortunately, David decides to follow through on this rebellion, and he has the people numbered, right? So often, we, we see only the outward actions of hidden sins. We see the outburst of anger, the illogical behavior, the relational tension when somebody in their life seems like every relationship they have, there's just tension amongst them. The verbal battle, somebody just always uh, wants to be verbally uh, abusive. But all of these things are just a manifestation of a heart problem, of a heart problem. And so what we see, we see this type of sin in David's life. But then what we see, and it's what we're going to spend a lot of our time on, is the repentance of David. It's the repentance of David. It must have been a difficult day for David the day that he realized that there would be great consequence to his sin. The Bible says, 1 Chronicles chapter, two, verse, chapter 21, verse 7 says, And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. He was displeased with this thing. You know, once we make our choice, we lose all control over the consequences. It's a helpless feeling to see somebody suffer because of our wrong choices. And people are going to suffer because of David's wrong choices. Thankfully, thankfully, David respond, responded in the right way, with repentance, with repentance. So what does repentance truly look like? We'll, we'll notice these three quick responses of David. The first thing is he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged it. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Repentance always begins with acknowledgement of our sin. David did not try to make excuses for his sin. He did not try to uh, blame his sin on somebody else. In fact, the Bible tells us that his heart was smote. If we look at the verses that we've examined in church in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10, it says, And David's heart smote after him after he had numbered the people. It, it, it was a true gut punch to David of what he had done. The conviction was, was truly felt in his heart in his heart. And David understood his need for repentance. You know what some people think repentance is, is they think they just need relief from the feeling of guilt. You know, if, if all we are looking for is wanting relief from the feelings of having done wrong, that's not full repentance. That's not full repentance. Real repentance is fully acknowledging our sin, not just looking for relief of our sin, right? It's the whole, you know, they're sorry, but they're really only sorry that they got caught. David wasn't sorry that he got caught. He, uh, he was in, in the sense that he, he was sorry of what he had done, not just the fact that he had gotten caught. And so we see this in his life. It has been said that repentance is siding with God against self. It is acknowledging that God is right and I am wrong. And it's taking full responsibility without blaming others or excusing it away. He acknowledged it. He acknowledged it. The second thing he did is, this is the toughest one. He accepted the consequences. He accepted the consequences. Sin always comes with consequences. Even after David acknowledged his sin, God did not withhold the consequences from him. Even in his mercy, God knows that we need chastisement, or chastening, excuse me, chastening to fully turn our hearts from sin. There must be consequences to sin. So the Bible says that um, uh, pre the preacher came to him and gave him choices. Said these are the three things that you can choose. That you can choose. The first one is you could have three years of famine. 
three months or three months of being defeated by his enemies or three days of pestilence throughout the land. And the thing that David chose was, he says, you know what? I don't want to put this into the hands of man. I'd rather be at the mercy of God. So the one thing that God would have been solely over, of course he was over all of it, was the three days of pestilence. So this is what David chose. It says, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel, and listen to this number, 70,000 men. Because of sin, 70,000 men. Chastening is never pleasant. But yielding to it when it comes, which is what David does, it could bring a sweet intimacy to you of your relationship with God. Because you understand that God does not chasten for fun. He corrects us because he loves us. And he loves us too much for, to allow us to go on sinning in our life with no consequences. He, re, he instructs us to zealously repent. In the letter to the churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 19, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We must have a heart of repentance. We see the sincerity of David's repentance through the acceptance of the consequences to his sin. Then lastly, in David's response here, so we see that he interceded for the people. We see that he interceded for the people. The Bible says, And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand and stretched out over Israel. And then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that I have commanded the people to be numbered? Even I is, that I is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me, on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. David, David was devastated about the consequences that his sin had caused in the life of the people that he was given rule over. <coughs> Excuse me. A heart full of repentance will understand that the consequences should be solely on them. Now, God has the choice. Once again, once you choose to sin, you no longer have the, 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 uh, the ability to choose the consequence of who, of who that covers. But, but David had a remembrance of the people. And then we see the remem remembrance of David. I'm glad this story doesn't end there. It actually has a beautiful ending. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 18 and 21, we see where the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord and the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of God, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David, and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. And here we see where David goes to him. For sake of time, we're not going to read all the scripture. But he, he asked for this place. And Ornan wants to give it to him. But David understands that it was something that would have to cost him something. And the Bible says David paid for the land. And he gave them even more. And, um, and, and we see that it was something that was very personal to David. But can I tell you a little bit about this place, this threshing floor? This place that David purchased was the very spot where Abraham had offered Isaac which also happens to be the very spot that Jesus Christ himself went to the cross of Calvary. It, it was this very place that David purchased as a price and as a payment of sacrifice. It's the exact same place that Jesus Christ himself paid the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. Such a wonderful correlation here of forgiveness and what forgiveness is. Jesus coming to be born into this world, live a sinless life, and go to the cross for you and I is the ultimate act of forgiveness. Why? He did that 2,000 years ago so that the sins of the world all these years later could be washed away only 
by the acceptance of that payment. And the acceptance comes from a repentant heart. I'm a sinner, Lord, and I trust in you for salvation. What a wonderful beginning there. But then as a Christian, when we begin to sin, sin comes into our life, and it's prevalent in our life. I hope you have true repentance. Too many Christians harden their heart to conviction. I hope you'll hear from the voice of the Lord and soften your heart and do his will. Have a happy Thanksgiving.